Uh, tonight, I want you guys to open up in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 52. And as we consider Jesus tonight, something I see in his love is his death. Do you guys know that God demonstrated his love towards us? And while we were yet sinners, what did he do? He died for us. That's what the cross declares to you and I. That's Romans 5, 8, by the way. Um, but I want to take a look tonight with you guys at Isaiah 52. And you guys might be like, well, why aren't we in Isaiah 53? Um, well, I want to look specifically at the suffering servant, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world together with you guys. But we see him as the exalted servant in the last few verses of chapter 52. And do you guys know that chapter breaks in the Bible aren't always in the best place? I mean, Isaiah 53 is about as good as it gets in the Old Testament, and it really should have started uh, in verse 13 of chapter 52. A lot of people refer to this passage of Scripture as being the Mount Everest of the Old Testament. It is the highest ground. It depicts for us in great detail the suffering of our Savior on the cross. And I want to give you guys a heads up, okay? Over the next few years, if the Lord tarries, we're going to, on Good Fridays, go through uh, a few verses here all the way through 53. So we're probably going to be doing this for four or five years. I went back. I was starting a study for our time together, and I'm like, man, I really love this passage of Scripture. I feel like I've preached this before. And sure enough, seven years ago, I preached that same passage of Scripture on a Good Friday. And I'm just like, well, I don't want to do that again, Lord. So what can we do? And I felt like, hey, here's a great place for us to take a few years to work through. So tonight we're just going to look at these few verses that we find at the end of 52 together. But this really depicts for you and I, a great description of our suffering Savior on the cross. I read a sermon earlier this week by, the guy, by a guy named of Joseph Parker. Uh, he was a preacher in the late 1800s. Um, he was commenting that over 100 years ago, how churches in his day were shrinking back from talking about the blood of Christ. Have you guys noticed that in our day? It's not talked about a whole lot. Um, he said, a dainty piety has forced upon us a dainty vocabulary. So listen, there's nothing dainty when it comes to this passage of Scripture as we consider this in Isaiah 53. It's a very, very graphic for a reason for you and I. So let's take a look here. It says, Behold my servant in verse 13 of chapter 52. Many scholars refer to this as the echo amo of the Old Testament. You guys remember the New Testament where Pilate said, Behold the man. Here we have God in the Old Testament saying, hey, behold my servant. So this was written by Isaiah. And does anybody know when Isaiah lived? 700 years before Jesus ever came. He penned these words. Have you guys heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls before? Do you guys know that we can trust the scriptures? Okay. Isaiah, they found scrolls that dated back 200 years before Jesus was ever even born. So we have these passages, okay, the entirety of the book of Isaiah. And I think it's really important for us because those who try to get rid of these chapters, and there are people who have tried to um, just espionage, uh, do away with this passage of Scripture because it so clearly speaks to Jesus Christ as being the suffering Messiah. You ask a Jewish person to read this passage of Scripture, they don't know what to do with it, Okay. Why? Because it speaks about Jesus. It sounds like New Testament, okay? Um, it describes very clearly all that he went through. You guys remember Philip in the book of Acts? How many of you guys are familiar with Philip? Okay. Um, there was a revival going on in Samaria. You guys remember that Ethiopian eunuch? Okay. God like raptured the guy and, hey, I'm going to have you go preach the gospel to this Ethiopian, right? And where did he begin to read from in the scriptures? Isaiah 53. Okay, and of whom do these things speak was the question. Well, Philip there preached Christ from this passage that we're going to be going through tonight. So we have clearly come to the highest thing that Isaiah ever seen. 
And you might be like, really, Pastor? Well, how about Isaiah chapter 6? Do you guys know that Isaiah actually got to go into the throne room of God? And behold, the Lord there seated on the throne in the train of his robe filled the temple. Man, what a glorious vision. But guys, the reality of what God lays down here for us, this was the greatest thing that the prophet Isaiah ever saw. You see that uh, here we see something that is really incomprehensible (laughs) beyond imagination. When God speaks and says, behold, look at my servant. Okay, So when you look, that word there is actually to gaze or to see clearly. Verse 13 again, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. It's very interesting here to note that the Father starts this song here. He takes Jesus and he exalts him. Do you see what God's doing? I'm going to exalt My son, Jesus, that's the first thing. And the reason, guys, the only way that we can have an understanding of the depths in which Jesus stooped (laughs) to become like you and I, like his creation, we got to get a glimpse of the heights in which he came from. And that's why God is doing this for you and I. Are you guys ready tonight to take a glimpse at the suffering servant exalted? I sure am. So... It's almost like God is telling you and I, hey, I want you to understand this entire passage. It's a passage that will take you down and pull your heart into depths that are really unimaginable. And I know that there is no defeat here, okay? I want you to know that. Also, I want you to see uh, the heights first God is saying. So when we know the depths in which he will stoop, he is accomplishing something. Behold my servant so prudently, That's to deal with wisdom. How many of you guys pray for wisdom all the time, right? Okay, well, we have Jesus Christ dealing here with discretion, prudently, dealing with something in wisdom to a complete end of it where something is being accomplished. Jesus knew why he came. Do you guys know that? It's not like, oh, they arrested me and they're going to want to kill me upon a cross. What's going on? How could this happen? All I did was love people and feed them a lot of food. You know, No, Jesus knew the whole time. You guys can jot down Hebrews 12 too. What does that passage tells us? Tells us? It says, Who for the joy set before him, Jesus, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and it sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, there was a joy set before our Lord and Savior. Okay? If you guys don't get anything else tonight, I want you to get this. You were that joy. He loved you so much. He was willing to go to the cross to endure the cross for you. Isn't that cool to think about, guys? That's what Good Friday is about. Wow, God, you actually loved us so much that you were willing to lay down your life. What a God. What a creator. So he shall move prudently, accomplishing the purpose from which he came. So he will be exalted, extolled. He will be lifted up. He will be very high. He will rise up. He will raise himself up. He will stand even higher. Some scholars have called this passage of Scripture the the commencement or the, the continuation, the climax. You see, the commencement to the resurrection, it really all begins here. Jesus died and he wrote it, rose again, right? The continuation is the ascension into heaven. And the climax, guys, where is Jesus today? Okay, we're talking about him dying on a cross, but we know Sunday's right around the corner. Okay, he rose from the dead and he's ascended on high and he's seated where? At the right hand of the Father right now, making intercession for you and I. That's crazy to think about, but he is alive right now. So, I want you guys to picture how often in scriptures, Jesus, him dying upon the cross, is really the key to our walks. You guys can jot down Ephesians 1, verses 18, 19, 20, and 21 in there. All come around the idea of who we are in Christ, and it's all because Jesus died for us and rose again. And even in Philippians 2, the first 10, 11 verses, you guys familiar with that passage of scripture? Because Jesus died on the cross, and rose again. You guys know every knee should bow and confess him. They're going to and confess him as Lord. I love passages of scriptures like that in the Bible. 
So behold my servant. So he's going to accomplish what he set out to do. Do you guys know that Jesus came with a mission? Yeah. So he shall be exalted, extolled, lifted to the place where there is only under and there is no over. That is the reality. So he will be above everything. So the Father sets the stage in exalting him. You guys see the stage? I'm trying to paint a picture for us all. Do you guys see the stage that God is setting here for us? He's exalting Jesus. And he starts in the way, um, in that way, because of verse 14, he says, Just as many were astonished at you, and his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So astonished, astoned in the Greek, it makes desolate, makes waste, paralyzed. You guys get the picture there? So the idea here is being what they saw. It staggered them. It actually froze them. Okay? Look at the servant Jesus. Okay? And they were desolate. They were laid waste. They were actually paralyzed by it. That's what God is telling us here. So I want us to note, it doesn't say that he was marred more than any other man who's ever lived. I've heard people preach that. They shouldn't preach that. It's not what it's actually saying. Okay? No, it's his visage. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it's a vision of distortion. He was a vision of desolation. It was a vision of disfigurement. So, today I got to watch The Passion of the Christ. How many of you guys have seen that? I let my sons watch it for the first time. It's a hard film to watch. They did that to our Lord and Savior. They did all of that. In truth, guys, they had to dumb it down a little bit. They couldn't make it really what it was like. You wouldn't have been even to reckon it, recognize him as a man. Okay, He would have been torn apart. I mean, Jesus at the end as he's being crucified still had his beard. We're told in the scriptures they pulled out his beard. So the Passion of the Christ, they did a great job, but it still wasn't close to what it really was like for Jesus that Good Friday. So here we see Jesus... Isaiah is saying his visage no longer looked like a man. That's what he's saying. It didn't look human any longer. Um, so the idea behind this, laid waste to make desolate, paralyzed at what they saw, it, it started with him being beaten. He was spit upon. He was blindfolded. And people beat him. He didn't have a clue where it was coming from. We're told he was scourged. You guys have heard about the Roman flagellum before. Many die before it's even over, the flogging. Okay, that's just how bad it was. Jesus went through all of that and still carried a cross to Golgotha to be crucified. So the process was one of examination. So when the criminal was being scourged, he opened his mouth to incriminate others of that crime or get other people in trouble. But Jesus opened not his mouth we're told. And he had nothing to confess to. Did Jesus have any sin, guys? Any sin? No. What is he going to confess to? They ended up crucifying him because he said he was the king of the Jews. Well, we know he's the king of the Jews. He is the son of God. He is God. You know? He can't lie and say he wasn't. <laughs> you know? Even on the cross itself, they put up a, a plaque and said that he was the king of the Jews. Okay, that was why he was crucified, but that's who he was, the king to come and save. So, um, and oftentimes if they would begin to confess, do you guys know that they would lighten up on the scourgings? They wouldn't be as bad. So for Jesus, it just would have gotten worse and worse. So if a criminal stayed quiet, it'd get heavier. So Jesus was silent as a lamb before the shears is silent. He opened not his mouth, so they laid on it heavier and heavier, which is no doubt why they uh, led Pilate to say, Behold the man. Look what we've done to him. Behold the man. You can't even tell what this is, but this is the man that you want to crucify. So it really, you know, 
a real miraculous that Jesus was still alive after his beating. So when they saw him um, being beaten, okay, they were paralyzed by what they saw. Do you guys get what God is telling us here in this passage? That paralyzed them. Some of you guys might be like, this is a little graphic. It's our Lord and Savior and what he went through. The scriptures speak to these things. This is the greatest vision that Isaiah ever saw. I don't know about you, but if you are a child of God, when you think about the cross and all that he went through that day, you just stand all the more in awe of our God. You loved me. That, you knew what was going to happen. You foresaw it. You knew. <laughs> and you loved me that way. It's awesome to think about. I think it's neat if you jumped into chapter 53, verse 3, doesn't it tell us that they turned their faces from him? That's, they couldn't even look at him. That's how bad it had gotten. So what they saw on the cross was a monstrosity, guys. That's what it was. The Old Testament tried to depict that. You see, when the worshiper came to worship, you brought an ox or you brought a lamb, right? A sacrifice had to be made when you came. And the lamb was always to be inspected and there wasn't to be any blemishes. It had to be a perfect lamb, a perfect sacrifice without blemish. So the lamb was inspected. And the cool thing, and I want you to catch this, the worshipers were never inspected. The sacrifice was inspected. The worshipers weren't. The sacrifice is what matters, guys. Some of us don't feel worthy. I have blemishes. I'm not good enough. That's okay. <laughs> the sacrifice is what matters, brothers and sisters. So, it was taken for granted from the beginning that the worshiper was sinful. The lamb had to be spotless, and when it was declared spotless by a priest, they would take their hand, have you guys heard of this before? And they would place it upon the head of that lamb. And it was a picture of transferring your sins. Okay? How many of you guys are sinful? We've all sinned, right? <laughs> and isn't it cool? Like, hey, to transfer our sin, to actually be able to get rid of them and move them somewhere else, that's pretty cool. And that was the picture of these lambs. They would place it upon their head, and they would identify there that transfer. And then they would be given a knife, and they would cut the throat. And you would feel, you know, the staggering or the wrestling uh, of the, you know, body. The blood would come out and they would gather it into a golden bowl. Um, and the animal would collapse. That's what would happen. And you guys know that they would sacrifice hundreds of thousands of lambs there in Jerusalem every single year. Okay, some of us, we consider that and just like, how could anybody do that? That was life. That was the norm back then. So, and I also want you guys to think about this. You would know that a sinless animal had just died in your place. I mean, what, it, what can it, how does an animal sin, right? <laughs> They're innocent. They haven't done, that's just a lamb, you know? An innocent lamb, animal had died. So the animal's skin um, then and the head would be taken off by itself and the kidneys the entrails would be taken out and laid around the head and the legs they would take off and they would pile it on top what a monstrosity think about it do you guys see the point that our god is getting at here in isaiah 52 for you and i okay that's what we saw that is what isaiah saw is he saw the suffering servant being exalted here and i think that's the point guys it no longer looked like a lamb jesus no longer looked like a human being after being tortured that way because the greater monstrosity guys would have been there on calvary on the cross so his visage was so marred we're told that he didn't even look like a man anymore and even worse guys the sin of all humanity was placed upon him all sin placed upon him a monstrosity beyond imagination okay because we can look at the physical what was going on spiritually that day all the sins i mean i have a lot you know and i'm just one person who's lived in lived in all time jesus took all our sin upon himself so from the heights to these unimaginable depths 
So crucified from the foundation of the world for my sin. Okay? You guys understand that I put him there? You put him there. Watching the Passion Day with my family is just like, wow, how could they do that? How could his own people, the Jewish people, the religious high priest dude, how could he want to see this holy man, this one who did miracles, who taught with authority, who had no fault? How could they do that to him? That's so, you guys understand it was us that put him there. They're no worse than us. We're all the same that way. So when a person comes to grasp that reality, it's really sobering. It's life-changing. It was my sin, okay? And maybe you haven't thought about it that way before. I hope that you will think on that, own that. It's good for us to have that perspective. Jot down 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Isn't that cool? Literally, Jesus took our sin, and he gives us his righteousness. Isn't that pretty cool? That's why we have to put faith, our faith in him. That's why we have to receive that gift, that sacrifice that he was by faith. How many of you guys have put your faith in Jesus personally? Praise the Lord. What a gift. And that's how we apply that sacrifice is we have to believe upon him. So sinless Jesus became sin-filled, that the sin that filled people would be sin-free. Um, I want to share a quote by a guy by the name of Robert Murray McChaney. He said this, God heaped upon his son all of our sins until there was nothing but sin to be seen. He appeared all sin so that nothing of his own beauty appeared it's a crazy thought to think about so every tyrant every evil thought okay um we gossip we lust all of it guys so he says behold my servant right so he's going to deal wisely strongly completely to the completion of the thing that he set out to do and then he will be exalted he will be extolled he will be lifted above all because those who saw him they staggered by what they were what they were seeing they were just blown away by it because he was mauled he was brutalized beyond any semblance of man whatsoever so this was a vision distortion desolation a vision of disfigurement now in verse 15 guys so because of this his brutalized frame and his death, he shall sprinkle many nations. You guys ever wonder what that means? He's going to sprinkle many nations. Okay. Do you think God just loves us? Just us Americans? Or does he love all people? For God so loved the whole world, right? All peoples. So because of his sacrifice, he shall sprinkle many nations the idea of sprinkling it shows up you can look it up yourself three times in the old testament that's it i thought there were more okay but three times leviticus 14 7 is one of them you can jot that down a priest would sprinkle a leper okay and they once they were cleansed okay they would be sprinkled so sprinkling of blood upon the head of a worshiper Sins were forgiven. That's the picture. So Jesus is doing the sprinkling. He is both the sacrifice and the sacrificer. So he is off, he's the offering and he's the high priest at the same time. Isn't it cool that Jesus just does it all? I think that's awesome. So how can that be? Well, there's no disparity in that, guys. Disparity between his exaltation and his humiliation. Okay? It's really cool to think on for a moment, and I want to do that with you guys. You see, between the height of who he was to the depths in which he went to save you and I, that is disparity. So there is no disparity in the scriptures between being the sacrifice for our sins and being the high priest who is at the right hand of God. He lives. 
to make intercession for you and I. So there's no confusion there. So no, what is incomprehensible is he or who he was to the degree which he stopped because of his love for us. So he shall sprinkle many nations. He shall cleanse many nations. Sacrifice for all people, all races, all nationalities, stretching to every part of the globe. Do you guys know that anybody can come to faith in Christ? Right? God so loved the world that whosoever believes, okay, will you believe? God's not going to make you believe. That's your choice. That's what I love about Holy Week. That's what I love about times like tonight. We get to consider, why did he die on the cross? A lot of people don't have a clue why Jesus died upon the cross. Okay? So, did we look at the last part of verse 15 yet? Kings shall shut their mouths at him. You guys catch that? For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. So, do you guys think it's cool that all kings and politicians will be silenced? I wish. There's times I hit the mute button. <laughs> yeah! um, so today, guys, um, it's just, oh, I don't want to talk about this at length. But you guys just to know to call someone a sinner, which is truthful, okay, we're all, that's politically incorrect to do. How dare you call me a sinner, you know? Well, it's a fact. It's the truth. Okay? If you're not a sinner, then you don't need a Savior. And then what's the point of Jesus? Okay? But you're lying to yourself. You do need a Savior because you are a sinner. Uh, anyways, uh, I, I think that type of thinking, it really is a lie from hell. Um, so now we have to be honest. We have to be. Okay? You're a sinner. Maybe that rubs you the wrong way. Great. Deal with reality. You are, I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Um, we're deplorable, twisted, we're messed up. But God, but God valo, valued you. And he loved you so much as an individual that he sent his son to pay the price for your sins, the wages of your sins. He died on the cross, Okay. Jesus came to die in your place, in my place. That's what I love about Good Friday. He loved us that much, guys. Isn't that cool? So what we might, that we might be sprinkled by the blood. So cleansed by his blood, forgiven, made new. Okay? Um, that, my friends, is aw it's awesome. This is incredible. This is the gospel. A lot of people don't like talk. Well, I don't like talk. This is bloody. This is messy. Talking about the cross and death and just how brutal it was. Yeah, guys. Sin's a serious thing. The sacrifice of our Lord and Savior was a serious thing. I think world leaders are going to be stunned. You guys can jot down Psalm 72. I'm going to read verses 8, 9, and 10 and 11 for you. It says this. He shall dominion also... Speaking of Jesus, from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth, those who dwell in the wilderness will bow before him, and the enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and, the, and of Isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve the Lord. Isn't that cool? We're all going to serve him. It's like... Philippians 2, right? Every knee will bow and confess that Jesus is Lord. So when he says, behold my servant, <laughs> what do we do with this? What do we do with this? It's here in the scriptures. It's the reality of Good Friday. It was all prophesied. Jesus was on a mission. <laughs> he did it. You see, what do we do with this? I know I need to understand the love of Christ more. That's an area I know I need to grow in. And I know this reality, this truth, puts things into perspective. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, it says that in the ages to come, 
he might show his exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Isn't that cool? That means today, this is what God's still doing. How many of you guys love the grace of God? It truly is amazing, guys. And it is something that he wants us to grow in. So in the ages to come, God will still be revealing in uh, in exceeding riches of the graces in which uh, are in him. Paul says to us in Philippians 3, he says, Not that I have apprehended, but the one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, that I may know him, okay? So do you know him? Also to know the power of his resurrection and to have fellowship in his sufferings, being conformed to his death. So the reality of the cross, the suffering servant, okay? This is something that we partake in as believers. So listen, our destination is not a place, okay? Um, It is an image conformed to what? His image, we're told in the scripture, of his death. Guys, get what the scripture is telling us there. This is important. So we need to realize. Less Landon, more Jesus is the answer. Amen? You guys get that? He must increase, we must decrease. Are we being conformed, sanctified? Are we becoming more like Jesus every day? That's the goal, to be Christ-like. So when I see his love in his death, the depths to which he stooped for me, I am I embrace it because my love for him, you know, it doesn't compare. I can grow. <laughs> so there's times I'm lazy, there's times I feel apathetic, there's struggles in the flesh, and I know the only hope for me is his grace. And when I look to the cross and I remember what Jesus did for me, it brings me to that reality. It brings me to that truth. So I want to encourage you guys, just as we get so excited about the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection life, okay? Good Friday is an important thing. The cross is very important to you and I as believers as we considered what our Lord and Savior did. One last scripture, and then we're going to have the worship team come up. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Think about that, guys. God loved you so much. He was willing to give all of himself for you. How will he not also freely give us all things? That's our God. He's given us so much, guys. So the key word, I think, is freely. Sometimes we think we need to earn it. No. (laughs) He gave it. The Christian life is about God freely showing, dispensing His riches of His grace to us. Us who are in Christ. So have you believed upon Christ? Maybe you know He died upon the cross. That's a fact. He rose from the dead. That's a fact. But have you personally put your faith in him? Are you in that place of saying, yes, Lord, (laughs) I will receive by faith all that you have?